That's how the devil does things. He will get you to think you have power over the occult realms through rituals, through ceremony, through these various books or whatever, and actually it's a fraud. Because really, we have, without, without Yeshua, we have no power over evil whatsoever. Okay, thank you. What's the difference between Wicca, witchcraft, and magic? Well, Wicca, it's, it's actually the, the, it's pronounced Wicca, really. It's the old Anglo-Saxon word that means bent or twisted originally. But it, it's the origin of our word witch. And, and so back in the 50s, when witches started coming out of the broom closet, pardon the pun, uh, they started calling themselves Wiccans because it sounded better excuse me, than calling themselves uh, witches, because witches had a really bad press back then. Everybody thought that uh, witches were ugly old hags with green skin, warts, and everything. Uh, witchcraft is what a lot of witches do, but not by means any of them, because Wicca is actually a religion. Witchcraft is a technology that some, it's a mental, spiritual technology that some witches use. Most witches, I dare say. But, but witchcraft is, is more or less the same thing as magic, except magic is, is higher, if you will. Uh, there's what is called low magic and what is called high magic. And typically, most witchcraft is low magic, which is it's kind of like in, in the Church of England. They call about they talk about low church and high church, and the high church is more ceremonial, and the low church is more simple and sort of almost like Protestant. Well, it's the same thing with this. The low magic, which is witchcraft, is usually pretty simple, more akin to what anthropologists would call folk magic, uh, whereas uh, magic is more like ceremonies and wearing fancy robes and very, very elaborate, you know, things where you have to be very literate, you have to read Latin and Greek and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, there's a big difference there. The technical definition of magic, which was made by the infamous magician Aleister Crowley, he said, magic is the art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. But I would add to that, because that's a little simplistic, I would add to that without any visible means of doing so. In other words, I can move a pencil across a table, and I've caused change to occur in conformity with my will, but that isn't really magic. If I could move that pencil without touching it, that would be magic. Okay, and how are you spelling magic? Well, that m most ceremonial, serious magicians spell magic the old English way with a K on the end, M-I-G-M-A-G-I-C-K, to distinguish it from stage magic press the digitation, pulling rabbits out of hats. Okay, thanks. So a lot of people believe that the power of witchcraft is imaginary. What do you say about that? Well, in a sense, they're right. Um, witchcraft, as in its power, as they're thinking of it, is imaginary. But instead of the, the witches believe, magic comes within them, or that it comes from being at one with the earth and at one with the sky and this kind of pantheistic thing where, you know, kind of like the Force in Star Wars, you know. But actually, there is a real power in witchcraft, but the power comes from the demonic realm. If you say, you know, if you, if you give yourself over to these gods, these ancient gods, and say, I'm going to serve you, what they don't realize is that behind those, those gods are a mask, and behind those masks is the demonic, ultimately Satan himself. And so when you do something magical, I did many things that were apparently, at least a very vast coincidences at least, if not downright miraculous at most, and uh, they were done by the power of demons. Okay, and how do you know that? Because a lot of people who maybe are into witchcraft mm -hmm. are going to say, well, that's not true. Well, let me give you an illustration. Um, this, this a friend of mine, colleague in the ministry, was on a radio show. And he was talking about this very subject. And a witch high priest called up and challenged him with the very question you asked. He said, well, I don't believe my powers come from demons. I believe my powers come from the, the sky god and the mother goddess. And my friend said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray right now in the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that all the demons in you that give you the power to do these things will be bound for one week until you come to your senses. And he prayed that prayer right over the air, and the guy just got mad and hung up. Two or three days later, the guy called the show. He wasn't even on, my friend wasn't even there. 
and the guy was frantic because he had nowhere else to call and he says I don't have my occult power anymore it's been gone from the very day you prayed that prayer or the other fellow did wow. and he said I want to because he, you know, he was into power and he said obviously your God has more power than my God and I want that power. Now, that's not the best reason to become a Christian. <laughs> but, you know, it was a start. And that guy ended up getting saved. And he was one of the most prominent witch high priests in the greater Seattle area. Well, wow, great story. So that, that kind of illustrates the point. And I could tell you several other stories of a similar nature. Okay, tell us one more. Well, okay. Uh, this is on a slightly different tack. But I'm sure many people know about the, the almost supernatural powers that supposedly are possessed by high-level kung fu masters. That, that, you know, they can, like, punch at a wall and not even touch it and have the wall collapse or make people fall down just by giving their, you know, their ki type shout at the person or whatever. Well, one time, another colleague of mine who's a minister in Wyoming, his meeting was disrupted by this local guy who was this really high-level, you know, Shaolin master. And he came in and he challenged the guy right there on the spot and wanted to fight him. He says, you, you see, you know, you claim you worship this great mighty God. Well, you know, take me on. So the guy just prayed in the name of Yeshua, and he said, you will not be able to move until I allow you to by the power of the blood of Yeshua. And the guy fell flat on his face before the altar, just spread eagle, and he, it was like the gravity around him had become like the gravity of Jupiter. And the guy was just pinned to the floor like, like there was a magnet there. And he, he laid there for like 10 minutes. Wow. And he finally started pleading with the guy to let him up. And, you know, the guy was a nice guy. And he, he, he asked the Lord to let him up, and he was fine. And then he repented and went to the altar and got saved. So, you know, again, that shows that, that what a lot of people think is power that comes from within or power that comes from the universe is actually a cult power. Okay. Great. Thank you for those stories. Um, a lot of people think that witchcraft is very rare. What would you say about that from your own experience? Well, again, I, I would say to a degree that's true. There are a lot of witches, but most of those witches don't know what they're doing. They don't really have a lot of occult power. They're basically playing around. It's still dangerous because they've turned their back on the living you know, Elohim, the living God, and they're, they're worshiping false gods. But, but even in my own life uh, as a witch... I had, in, in 16 years of practicing the occult, maybe maybe a half dozen times in that, in that life when I did something really astounding. There were a lot of times when, when we would do magic and nothing would happen. Quite a lot, in fact. But every now and then the devil would throw us a bone. And we, 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 I remember years ago we had seen this movie, uh, Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman. And there's this old Native American Indian chief in it. And he was supposed to go up on top of a mountain and die and do magic so he would die. And nothing happened. And he walked on the mountain and said, eh, sometimes the magic works and sometimes it doesn't. And so that became kind of our, ta our tagline. Oh, well, sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. So it's not like there are all these witches running around doing all these wonderful, miraculous things. It's, it's a comparative rarity, but there are, there are literally tens of thousands of witches in America, probably hundreds of thousands by now. Uh, it was very rare when we got into it back in the, in the late 60s, but now it's, I mean, you can go to any occult bookstore or even any regular bookstore and find like you know, 25, 30 books on how to be a witch. Mm. Wow, thank you. Would you please share us the story about the man who um, got attacked by a demon in his garage when he tried to Call him up. Well, this is this is ceremonial yes. magic now, which is like high art, high church, high theater. But the idea is, you you lay down this special circle on the floor with chalk and sulfur and various other things, depending on what ritual you're doing. And then you stay in the circle as the magician, and you outside the circle, you you set up this what's called a triangle of manifestation on the floor, and you call up some powerful demon spirit to come and serve you. And supposedly, as long as you're in this circle, he can't hurt you. That's the rules. And so this guy was calling up the demon, what, what the demon of Aleister Crowley called the mighty demon, Haranzen. This is one of the mightiest and most feared of all demons on earth. And he was calling this demon up, and it took like hours and hours, he, these incantations, and 
vile smelling incense was filling this garage and he basically turned into, a, into this ceremonial temple. And, you know, all of a sudden the demon started to manifest. And you could see this just awful looking thing that was indescribable. And he started to command it because the idea is you command this demon that he will have to obey you from then on. Kind how, of like a genie. How would the did the demon just appear like as a ghost in the room? Or no, what? it was like this big sort of slimy tentacle, you know, amorphous, uh, really not easy to describe, you know, very, very pustulant and tentacles and slithery and, you know, not at all anthropomorphic, hmm. you know. And he was he was exerting his force on this demon, and and the the, the thing was reaching for Shen. The the magic circle was actually glowing. It was so powerful. And I know this is true because I'm the one who was sitting there keeping track of all this as a scribe. Because every ceremony magician has a little lowly peon flunky to write everything down. Wow. Kind of like a scribe. So this demon, like how big was it? It towered to the very roof of the garage. Huh? And all of it, and it's because I was sitting in what they call a neutral triangle, so the demon didn't mess with me. And, and was it like solid, or could you sort of see through? It was sort of amorphous. But see, the ideal is is, that, is the more incense you burn, and the more blood you shed, the demon draws substance from this. This is what's called a material basis in ceremonial magic. So the more incense the guy burned, the more easily you could see the demon. Hmm. Well, finally, just as when this thing is reaching crescendo, all of a sudden. The phone rang, and the guy reached out of the circle to answer the phone, and instantly, the circle vanished, and he vanished, just in a flash of sulfur. And the funny thing was, there was no phone in the room. Oh. That's how tricky these demons can be. And I went in, and I told the guy's wife, <laughs> widow, <laughs> and, and, you know, she was also into this. She was a witch, a witch and a sorceress. And she was just sort of philosophical about it, you know, and oh, well, you know, it happens. I mean, she was very upset, but I mean, you can't call the police and say a demon kidnapped my husband and carried him into the abyss. You know, they don't really have jurisdiction there. So um, that illustrates, even though people think this is either, you know, fun stuff like Harry Potter or it's, it's like, you know, just, just even not even real, it can be very real. Now, I'm not saying that happens every week, that kind of thing. It probably doesn't. But this guy was a very high-level ceremonial magician, and yet he was still able to be tricked by the demon. Wow. Now, what's the definition of a ceremonial magician? Well, that's like a ceremonial magic is the highest form of magic. And it's where you have to learn long, elaborate, some rituals, like we did one ritual called the, the Sacred Magic of Amr Malim, the Mage, that took six months <gasps> of preparation. Wow. And every day you have to go through purifications. And, and many of your, your viewers probably have heard the, the magic word abracadabra. Yeah, sure. Well, that came from that. That's a word on a magic square from the sacred magic of Robin Williams and the Mage. And, and that usually they involve robes and incense, and you have to wear certain colored robes and certain colored candles, and you have to have wands and swords and. You know, all kinds of stuff. It's very. It's not something that a, you know, that a, that a person who didn't have a lot of money would want to do. And, and usually it involves either invocation or evocation. Invocation is where you believe you're calling on something higher than yourself, like an angelic being. These people believe that they can call upon angels and command them, which, of course, is, you know, horse pucky. Hmm. That's what they believe. Now, an evocation is where they call on something that's lower than a human being, like a demon, an elemental, an elementary, or something like that, and command them to serve them. And I, that particular um, book that I was talking about, they would have all these talismans that we would draw on parchment, that would be like magic squares, as if they'd have letters in them, and like very, a talisman to find treasure, or a talisman to, to have a woman fall in love with you. Or a, or a talisman to be able to fly through the air. And you would have, you would get conversation and knowledge with your HGA, your Holy Guardian Angel. That was the ultimate goal of this. And the Holy Guardian Angel would touch these different talismans and empower them so then you could find treasure or fly or whatever it happened to be. So we went through all of this stuff, just months of it. And we did the ritual, and then of course we had all these talismans and none of them worked. 
Okay. Does that mean there's something wrong with guardian angels? No, there's nothing wrong with guardian angels. This is just a construct that, that they come... Because you've got to realize, these people that came up with this stuff in the Middle Ages, that's where most ceremonial magic originated, was between like the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s. Uh, they lived in fear of their lives, because if they were found, the Catholic Church, which was really the only church in those days, would burn them at the stake. And so they made their stuff sound very Christian. Oh. They used like biblical. I mean, if you were to read some of these things, you would think you were reading like there there might be psalms, there might be long passages where the where the person is addressed either in the name of the name of God, you know, like Yahweh or, or you know El Elyon or Adonai or something or whatever. And and so they were made to appear to be very holy and very sanctimonious. And, and they were often written in Latin, which was, of course, the sacred language. So uh, the, the problem is that they did that to mask the fact that they were actually trafficking with dark forces. Well, well, sometimes we have, like, politicians will say a prayer to God, so that means they could be praying to someone else. How would you tell the difference? Well, I mean, only, you really, only Yahweh God knows a man's heart or a woman's heart. So... If he is saying a prayer, we don't know if he's really praying to the true God or not. Uh, because really, you know, this is my uh, surprise somebody reads, but the, the name of God is not God. That's not his name. That's actually the name of an ancient uh, Sumerian little g god of fortune or good luck. The name of the true and living deity is Yahweh. And, you know, and his son, of course, is Jesus Yeshua. So if you pray in those names, you know, you may or may not be a genuine uh, believer. You only, only, you know, only the Almighty knows that. We, we're told not to judge people's hearts, but only to judge their fruits. And if there's someone who says, oh, I'm a Christian politician, you know, all this stuff, and then he's going out there and doing all this reprehensible stuff, then you know he's probably, you know, you got to kind of be a fruit inspector. I see. Okay. Can you tell us some more stories that show witchcraft has some power. One example, um, there's a law within the witches, the, the witches have their own kind of Bible, it's called the Book of Shadows. And basically, one of the rules in it is the law of threefold return. If you do something good to someone, you, you're supposed to get it back three times better. If you do something nasty to another person, you get it back three times worse. Well, Way back in the very beginningest days of my being a witch, I was just a little baby witch. And um, I had this other, not, not my wife, I hadn't even met my wife yet, I had this other girl who was working as kind of a sort of substitute priestess. And I bought her a set of what are called bigas, which is the word for the witch jewels. And it's like a special necklace and crown and all, and they're very sacred. Kind of like, it's sort of like a bargain basement version of the crown jewels in the Tower of London, if you will. And, and because every head of a coven is actually a queen. She's a witch queen. And anyhow, this girl had a friend who was not really a very good friend, and she came in, and while the girl wasn't looking, she stole those things and pawned them, those jewels. They weren't even very expensive, you know, but, but it was the idea that this girl stole something from a goddess. Well, because of this law of threefold return, within 24 hours, this young lady, who was only like 19 or 20 years old, fell down two flights of stairs, broke her back, and was paralyzed from the waist down, as far as I know to this day. Um, that's not obviously a very good thing. We also, no. we did numerous occasions, we did spells of healing. Uh, one, one time a lady in our, our coven, her husband was having a problem with, with his, um, what they call erectile dysfunction, and we did a spell of love and healed that. Uh, so, you know, Again, there is real stuff happening here, but it's powered by the demonic. It's Thanks. not powered by, you know... And what might be the downside to those people? I mean, something good happened, but what's going to be the well, downside down the track? that, I mean, again, the devil never gives you anything without taking something greater away from you. That's the danger. And so the downside is, is that all these people got more faith in the gods of Wicca and less faith in the true God of the Bible. That's the main downside. They were more and more deeply deceived. Now, here's the funny thing. You should ask that. Without saying any names, this, this fellow who had the problem, 
once that spell was done, within about a year and a half, he was running around cheating on his wife. <gasps> his wife didn't know about it. Oh. And he ended up finally, and she was the sweetest young lady, and he finally ended up divorcing her and marrying some, like, you know, 17-year-old chick who was, like, you know, 10 years younger than his wife, kind of typical. It was like he was having a midlife crisis and he wasn't even 29 years old. Um, so that's an interesting w illustration of how this kind of thing can backfire on you. You end up with sort of a case of permanent preemptism. Mm, thank you. Can you tell us another story to show how the power of Jesus is greater than even all these other powers? Well, when I had gone on, and we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here, and, and several years after this time, I had gotten involved in Satanism. And um, I met a guy who was the, one of the highest ranking Satanists in the whole Midwest, and he was teaching me. And an interesting thing happened. A, lady, a guy, I should say, came and paid this fellow, I think it was 500 bucks, to kill his ex-wife by a magical curse. In other words, he put out a psychic hit on his ex-wife because he wanted custody of the kid. Not a very nice guy. And he paid us this money, and he had this fellow ask me to help out with a curse. And so we got out, and we started doing curses. Nothing worked. Nothing worked. In fact... We'd send out these power, we even did what's called in Voodoo a Gran and Vutramat, which is one of the great, most powerful curses you can level against someone. Nothing. The only thing that happened is that upon numerous occasions, these, these demonic forces we would send out against this woman would come back and beat the tar out of us. It was like they would crawl back and we'd get hit with horrible things, you know, like asthma attacks and seizures and whatever. And later on I found out that this guy that had uh, made the contract. He was a the son of a preacher, and his wife was a Christian. Now, obviously, this guy wasn't much of a Christian, but his wife was still walking with the Lord, and she was protected by the blood. And so everything we threw at her just bounced right back. Just no matter what we did, it just did not work. And of course, since we got saved. We've had, I, we've got so many people mad at us. We've got the Mormons mad at us, the Masons mad at us, the witches mad at us, the Satanists mad at us. We've got so many people cursing us, we have to, you know, kind of like, you know, keep a phone book full. And yet, 99% of this stuff never gets through because we're protected. You know, it's kind of funny. The Hebrew word for blood is dom. And I tell people, warm to the dom. Great. <laughs> like, kind of like a, the force field that's around us that protects us by the power of the living God. Great. What can you say about the light, since so many people think if there's a demon or a bad thing that they'll just send it to the light and that solves all problems? Well, we were taught that as, as spiritualist mediums, because both my wife and I were ordained as, as spiritualist uh, ministers and mediums. Oh, you just if you see a spirit coming, you just say, oh, do you stand in the light? Or like you say, if it's a bad, oh, I just send it to the light. You know, well, people forget that light is like, it's neutral. I mean... And Lucifer himself, the name means light bearer. He's called an angel of light in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians. So light in and of itself, I mean, there can be a false light. And that's the problem. You know, when you, you know, I know when I went through the Luciferian initiation, I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but it was like this searing, blinding light came into my brain, just like someone pouring molten light, molten lava into my mind. And it blinded me. I mean, even though I had my eyes closed, the light was so bright, it was like the incandescent light of a thousand suns. And that was my illumination. That was my enlightenment with the light of Lucifer. So I had all the light you could possibly want. I felt like my brain had a suntan by the time we were done. But I knew nothing. I was in spiritual darkness. So sometimes, you know, the, the illusion of light is actually the deepest sort of darkness. And it's much, more, it's much more efficacious to challenge an evil spirit in the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ.